Our lesson today comes from the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel, beginning in the first chapter, verse 24, and through the second chapter, verse 11. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Ruth. Out of all of the books in the Bible, Samuel is probably my favorite. First and second Samuel are probably my favorite. They're so descriptive. And uh, the story of Samuel is one that's close to my heart. It's Mother's Day. I thought I would share with you some quotes from some famous and not so famous people about mothers. Okay, Buddy Hackett, that great theologian, Buddy Hackett. <laughs> my mother's menu consisted of two choices, take it or leave it. Another great theologian, Milton Berle. If evolution really works, how come mothers only have two hands? This is a theological group it's called the Golden Girls. It's not easy being a mother. If it were easy, fathers would do it. Ed Asner said, raising a kid is part joy and part guerrilla warfare. This from an unknown source. I'd like to be the ideal mother but I'm too busy raising my children. <laughs> Child rearing myth number one. Labor ends when the baby is born. From Joanna at age 13. Every time I complain to my mom I'm bored, she tells me to go clean my room. Jamie at 16. No matter what I do, my mom can always tell when I'm lying. Tiffany, age eight, I like this one. Don't pick your nose because your mom will scream. 
Emily at age 10 has an observation that moms indeed make better lunches than dads. Ben at age 10 said, when your mom says try it, you'll like it. You probably won't. <laughs> Leslie at age 12 is wise beyond her years. Sometimes the most loving answer a mother can give you is no. Heather at age 16 simplifies it down. Dogs and mothers love you no matter what. And Riley at age 13, when your mother is mad and asks you, do I look stupid? It's probably best not to answer. <laughs> Father of our country, George Washington, said, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am, I owe to my mother. I attribute all of my success to the moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. And Abraham Lincoln said, I remember my mother's prayers, and they've always followed me. They have clung to me all of my life. All that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Pope Paul VI said, every mother is like Moses. She does not enter the promised land. She prepares a world that she will not see. I think it's safe to say, I think I'm safe in saying this, that the one thing that every single one of us in this room have in common is we all had a mother. Right? I, th I think I'm safe in saying that. Now, some of us are extremely blessed, right? We've had wonderful mothers, and they're still with us, and we get to talk to them frequently. Which, by the way, if you're in this category and you haven't talked to your mother this week, call your mom today. Call your mom more than once a week, by the way. She'd probably appreciate it. Some of us, we don't have our mothers around anymore. We wish, we wish that we could call and talk to our mothers. But we have wonderful memories, right? And some of us, some of us, well, we maybe got the short end of the stick. Our mothers left something to be desired. But we have a wonderful person in our life who's like a mother to us. And for that, we're thankful. Some of us were blessed with a mother who chose us, didn't give birth to us, but adopted us into our heart and into her home. Some in the room are obviously mothers. And no matter what age your children are, they're still on your heart, aren't they? My mother said she remembers her mom telling her, Honey, they only spend moments on your feet, but they will spend a lifetime on your heart. Now, some of you here have the pleasure of being grandmothers, and you get to spoil your grandchildren rotten and then give them back. My mom said if she knew how much fun grandchildren were, she would have had them first. Some here are heartbroken because they have severed relationships with their children. Or worse, they've had to bury their children. The heartache of losing a child. Others here have gone through the pain of not being able to conceive a child for a season or maybe perhaps ever. Whatever category you fall into, Mother's Day is a glorious occasion. It's a wonderful day. I hope you will celebrate this day. And if it's extremely difficult for whatever reason for you, I'm sorry. I genuinely am. And I want you to know that there are people here at Hillside that will pray with you, cry with you, walk through life with you. And we want you to know that you're not alone. Because I guarantee you, whatever your situation or your scenario is, there's probably more than one person in this room who has dealt with or is dealing with the exact scenario that you find yourself coping with today. So I hope you'll reach out to whom God has placed in your path and know you're not alone. Today, we celebrate mothers, all mothers, including those ladies who fill our lives with joy just because of who they are, because they're a mother figure for us. And today, we celebrate God who is the model of love, not just for mothers, but for everyone. Now, 
there's a number of scriptures that speak about mothers and parenting and and proverbs on wise parents and all of that sort of stuff and I'm no expert and didn't feel like giving women a uh, a lesson in parenting because I probably would do a bad job of that anyway so I chose Hannah the mother of Samuel story of Hannah okay main characters in this story Elkanah was her husband Hannah was his first wife now in the Old Testament because of the scenario of agriculture working the land needing children to sustain life and then also because of death and and certain things and women couldn't own property there were just certain rules there would be more than one wife in a family I'm not saying it's right it's just the way it was and so Hannah was the first wife she was loved dearly Peninnah we don't know her scenario but she was Elkanah's second wife. Maybe she was the wife of his brother. And Jewish tradition would say, if your brother passes away, you marry his wife and take care of his family so that his bloodline can continue on. So we don't know the situation. But Hannah was barren. She couldn't have kids. And Elkanah loved her. And Peninnah, she had born Elkanah many children. And every year they would go to, to Shiloh to, the, to sacrifice to the Lord at Shiloh. And they would go to the temple and they would go to, to Eli the priest and they would sacrifice. And, and Elkanah would always, always take more to offer to God on behalf of Hannah and that part of his family than he did Peninnah because he loved her. And he said, don't you know you're worth more to me than, than ten sons? Oh, how I love you. But Hannah wanted to be a mother. She had grief and pain. And, and in her hour of need, she went to the temple and she was pouring her heart out before God. And the priest came in. And he thought she was drunk because she was having a conversation with somebody who wasn't there. And she assured him she wasn't. She said, I promise God that if he'll give me a son, I will return this son back to God. Well, Eli said, your faith is great. God will grant the request. So, sometime later, she bore a son and she named him Samuel. She didn't go back to Shiloh for a few years until the child was weaned. So I'm guessing it could have been anywhere from two to five, depending on, on how they did things in those days. Now, how many of you all remember, as mothers, the first day that you dropped your child off at daycare? How about kindergarten second child not so hard first child yeah that one's hard. second child you're going no go 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 how many of you all remember the first time you dropped your child off at college anybody cry on the way home I told Dolly I said she's just in Evansville that was hard sending them out to where they're no longer in your nest whether it just be at daycare for the day or at kindergarten for the school year or at college imagine taking your three to five year old son to the temple where you're going to leave him to serve God imagine the love that Hannah must have had for her son and imagine the great love that she must have had for God taking great faith so Hannah leaves Samuel at the temple and she would come back every year and it says she would make him a little robe or uh, a little priestly outfit like the priest had and she would bring it back before him and Eli would bless Elkanah and her and he told them he said God's going to give you more children your faith is great and so she would go on to have three more sons and, and two daughters and Hannah's story ends here. At least her recorded story does. But the story of Samuel is just beginning. Because the Lord called Samuel to serve him as a priest, as a prophet, and as a judge. He was Israel's last great judge. And Samuel was the, the one, the prophet, that anointed the first king of Israel, Saul. And then would anoint the second king of Israel, David who God promised, you will, someone in your line will sit on the throne forever. 
He wasn't talking about David's sons. He was talking about the king. His son would come from that line. God used Samuel to influence an entire nation of people. And he's still using Samuel. I'm preaching on him today. But Samuel's faith was a gift from his mother. Samuel's faith was a gift from his mother and was a result of his mother's prayers. I like Pope Paul VI quote the best, I think, out of all those I read. Every mother's like Moses. She never enters the promised land and she prepares a world that she will not see. Hannah was such an influential person on the nation of Israel that our king, Jesus, our savior, his mother, Mary, modeled her prayer. That's recorded in Luke after the one that Ruth read for you today. Hannah's prayer was an expression of her relationship with God and the realities of life. Hannah's prayer, you will admit, if you read it, is real. It's pretty raw. I mean, she poured out her heart before God. She didn't hold anything back. She shared her pain, her frustrations, her anger, her bitterness. She shared her torment and her weakness. She claimed her, her joy and her triumph, hope, promise, provision, strength. Hannah's prayers are a reflection of life, aren't they? The highs, the lows, the peaks, and the valleys. I mean, if our lives were a line graph, think back to your early level math. Some of you are dealing with fifth grade math and graphs right now, right? But think of the line graph. Do you think that your life, if represented by a line, would just go neatly on a straight trajectory up from birth to death? Just a pleasant little line. Maybe in fantasy world, right? Because most of our lives, the trajectory of our life looks a lot more jagged, doesn't it? It's up, it's down, it's over. Some of us, it's backwards and forwards and up. And it's not neat at all, is it? Life's hard. I don't want to look at things from Pollyannish rose-colored glasses sort of view and pretend that, that, well, things are not as bad as they seem or, or tell you, you know, if you'll just pray more and have greater faith, everything will be all right in the morning because we're never promised a life without pain, are we? We are promised that God will be present with us and God's grace provides strength. And our lives, much like the Christian faith, seem to be a paradox, don't they? One day, we're celebrating success, awards, game-winning hits, dance recitals, kids singing at church. The next day, we're nursing sick kids or ailing parents. We're leaving a hospital or saying goodbye to one we love. One day, we're camping and playing at the beach, right? Or having a mother-daughter sleepover while another day is drudgery bad grades rebellion except for my kids none of my kids are rebellious I was the rebellious one by the way life's not all roses and daisies is it the good the bad they all get mixed up together and I think Hannah's prayer reflects the realities of life it was up it was down it was the best of times it was the worst of times there were highs there were lows there were peaks there were valleys so today we celebrate. We celebrate. Even if it's hard for some reason, I would invite you to celebrate. Tomorrow may be a struggle and yesterday may have been a challenge, but today celebrate. Celebrate you, your mom, your grandmother, your aunt, a mentor, a teacher, a friend. I think mothers all give us the gift of, of greater compassion and understanding. Mothers and dogs, they love you no matter what you've done. Well, unless you don't feed the dog and then it really doesn't like you very much, does it? But celebrate. 
There's a quote I've read somewhere, and, and it's one of those that on just the right day, it'll make you really get sick to your stomach, okay? Uh, if you read it on just the right day. But I, somewhere I read it, and I'll probably mess it up, and someone can correct me. But it said that, you know, life's not about waiting for the storm in life to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Making lemonade out of lemons or one of those, you know, nice sayings that we all cling to. I have it on good authority that mothers want more for their children than just happiness. They want their children to experience joy, deep-seated joy. They want them to become the best that they can be and be all that God has in store for them to become. They want their children to develop a heart for God and a heart for other people. They want to discover what God has in store for their lives. I have this on very good authority from mothers. And I may have shared with you all before that, that whenever I, I experienced my call to ministry and I finally decided in my 30s what God intended for me to do with my life. So if you're in your late 20s or 30s and still don't know, there's hope. I called my mother. And I'd always heard the story, and it made my sister sick to their stomach, that my parents wanted a son very bad. And they prayed. My parents, I started attending church nine months before I was born. Didn't I? Yeah. And my parents prayed for a child. And on, my, on the day of my birth, I had heard the story that even the doctor shed tears on my birthday. Oh, Seriously. What I didn't know that my mom told me after I told her that, that I finally knew what I was supposed to do. She said, I've been praying that prayer since the day you were born. God placed you, the doctor placed you into my arms. And I prayed and I told God that he had given you to me and I was giving you back to him. And she said, so I'm not surprised. It's what I've been praying since you were born. Maybe that's why the story of Hannah and Samuel are so close to my heart. But I didn't know that until my mother told me in my 30s because she said, I wanted your dreams to be your dreams. I wanted your purpose to be your purpose, not my dreams and my purpose. Isn't it amazing how much mothers learn raising their children? I mean, really, 13 or 14, how many of you all assumed or knew for a fact that your mother was the dumbest person on the face of the earth? Period. Okay? And this continued, right? Teenage years, well into the early 20s. But by the time you hit about 25 or so, isn't it amazing how much your mother learned? Think about that for a minute. Isn't it amazing how much she learned from the time you were 13 or 14 till the time you were 25. And by the time you reached 30, most of us, would probably agree that our mother may perhaps be the smartest person on the face of the earth. Today we celebrate mothers. For moms, your prayers are powerful. God hears your prayers. If today is hard for you for some reason, like Hannah, I would invite you to celebrate and have joy in the midst of your pain. It is possible. The prayers of a mother are powerful. Call your mother today if she is still here. Say a prayer for your mother. Say a prayer for those people who are like a mother to you. But celebrate today all of the wonderful influences in your life that have helped you become what you are today. Thank God for mothers.